Natural law Latin, ius naturale, lex naturalis, is a philosophy asserting that certain rights are inherent by virtue of human nature, endowed by nature—traditionally by God or a transcendent source—and that these can be understood universally through human reason. As determined by nature, the law of nature is implied to be objective and universal, it exists independently of human understanding, and of the positive law of a given state, political order, legislature or society at large. Historically, natural law refers to the use of reason to analyze human nature to deduce binding rules of moral behavior from nature's or God's creation of reality in mankind. The concept of natural law was documented in ancient Greek philosophy, including Aristotle, and was referred to in Roman philosophy by Cicero. References to natural law are also found in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, later expounded upon in the Middle Ages by Christian philosophers such as Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas. The School of Salamanca made notable contributions during the Renaissance. Modern natural law theories were greatly developed in the Age of Enlightenment, combining inspiration from Roman law with philosophies like social contract theory. Key proponents were Alberico Gentili, Francisco Suarez, Richard Hooker, Thomas Hobbes, Hugo Grotius, Samuel von Puffendorf, Matthew Hale, John Locke, Francis Hutcheson, Jean-Jacques Berlamachy, Emmerich de Vattel, Cesare Beccaria and Francesco Mario Pagano. It was used to challenge the divine right of kings, and became an alternative justification for the establishment of a social contract, positive law, and government—and thus legal rights—in the form of classical republicanism. Conversely, the concept of natural rights is used by others to challenge the legitimacy of all such establishments. Contemporarily, the concept of natural law is closely related to the concept of natural rights. Indeed, many philosophers, jurists and scholars use natural law synonymously with natural rights Latin, ius naturale, or natural justice, while others distinguish between natural law and natural right, because of the intersection between natural law and natural rights, natural law has been claimed or attributed as a key component in the United States Declaration of Independence 1776, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen 1789 of France, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 of the United Nations Nations General Assembly, as well as the European Convention on Human Rights 1953 of the Council of Europe. History The use of natural law, in its various incarnations, has varied widely throughout history. There are a number of theories of natural law, that differ from each other with respect to the role that morality plays in determining the authority of legal norms. This article deals with its usages separately rather than attempt to unify them into a single theory. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Judaism. Those who see biblical support for the doctrine of natural law often point to Abraham's interrogation of God on behalf of the iniquitous city of Sodom. Abraham even dares to tell the Most High that his plan to destroy the city Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 would violate God's own justice, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that so the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? This almost Socratic reply became for later writers the beginnings of natural rights theory. In this respect, natural law as described in the interaction between Abraham and God predates the later Greek exposition of it by Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. However, an even earlier set of laws is attributed to the seven laws of Noah. The seven Noahide laws as traditionally enumerated are the following Not to worship idols Not to curse God To establish courts of justice Not to commit murder Not to commit adultery or sexual immorality not to steal. Not to eat flesh torn from a living animal. According to the Genesis flood narrative, a deluge covered the whole world, killing every surface dwelling creature except Noah, his wife, his sons and their wives, and the animals taken aboard Noah's ark. According to this, all modern humans are descendants of Noah, thus, the name Noahide laws in reference to laws that apply to all of humanity. After the flood, God sealed a covenant with Noah with the following admonitions Genesis chapter 9. Flesh of a living animal, only flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. 9 to 4. Murder and courts, and surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. 
9 to 5 minus 6 topic ancient greece topic plato Although Plato did not have an explicit theory of natural law, he rarely used the phrase natural law except in Gorgias 484 and Timaeus 83e. His concept of nature, according to John Wilde, contains some of the elements found in many natural law theories. According to Plato, we live in an orderly universe. The basis of this orderly universe or nature are the forms, most fundamentally the form of the good, which Plato describes as the brightest region of being. The form of the good is the cause of all things, and when it is seen it leads a person to act wisely. In the Symposium, the good is closely identified with the beautiful. In the Symposium, Plato describes how the experience of the beautiful by Socrates enabled him to resist the temptations of wealth and sex. In the Republic, the ideal community is, "...a city which would be established in accordance with nature." <laughs> Aristotle. Greek philosophy emphasized the distinction between nature, physis, phi u acute cis, on the one hand, and law, custom, or convention, nomos, nuo acute mos, on the other. What the law commanded would be expected to vary from place to place, but what was by nature should be the same everywhere. A law of nature would therefore have the flavor more of a paradox than something that obviously existed. Against the conventionalism that the distinction between nature and custom could engender, Socrates and his philosophic heirs, Plato and Aristotle, posited the existence of natural justice or natural right Of these, Aristotle is often said to be the father of natural law. Aristotle's association with natural law may be due to the interpretation given to his works by Thomas Aquinas. But whether Aquinas correctly read Aristotle is in dispute. According to some, Aquinas conflates natural law and natural right, the latter of which Aristotle posits in Book V of the Nicomachean Ethics, Book IV of the Eudaimian Ethics. According to this interpretation, Aquinas's influence was such as to affect a number of early translations of these passages in an unfortunate manner, though more recent translations render those more literally. Aristotle notes that natural justice is a species of political justice, specifically the scheme of distributive and corrective justice that would be established under the best political community. Were this to take the form of law, this could be called a natural law, though Aristotle does not discuss this and suggests in the politics that the best regime may not rule by law at all. The best evidence of Aristotle's having thought there was a natural law comes from the rhetoric, where Aristotle notes that, aside from the particular laws that each people has set up for itself, there is a common Law that is according to nature. Specifically, he quotes Sophocles and Empedocles. Universal law is the law of nature. For there really is, as everyone to some extent divines, a natural justice and injustice that is binding on all men, even on those who have no association or covenant with each other. It is this that Sophocles' Antigone clearly means when she says that the burial of Polynices was a just act in spite of the prohibition, she means that it was just by nature. Not of today or yesterday it is but lives eternal, none can date its birth, and so Empedocles, when he bids us kill no living creature, he is saying that to do this is not just for some people, while unjust for others. Nay, but, an all-embracing law, through the realms of the sky, unbroken it stretcheth, and over the earth's immensity. Some critics believe that the context of this remark suggests only that Aristotle advised that it could be rhetorically advantageous to appeal to such a law, especially when the particular Law of one's own city was averse to the case being made, not that there actually was such a law. Moreover, they claim that Aristotle considered two of the three candidates for a universally valid, natural law provided in this passage to be wrong. Aristotle's paternity of natural law tradition is consequently disputed. <laughs> Stoic natural law The development of this tradition of natural justice into one of natural law is usually attributed to the Stoics. The rise of natural law as a universal system coincided with the rise of large empires and kingdoms in the Greek world. Whereas the higher 
Law that Aristotle suggested one could appeal to was emphatically natural, in contradistinction to being the result of divine positive legislation. The Stoic natural law was indifferent to either the natural or divine source of the law. The Stoics asserted the existence of a rational and purposeful order to the universe, a divine or eternal law, and the means by which a rational being lived in accordance with this order was the natural law, which inspired actions that accorded with virtue, as the English historian A. J. Carlyle (1861–1943) notes. There is no change in political theory so startling in its completeness as the change from the theory of Aristotle to the later philosophical view represented by Cicero and Seneca. We think that this cannot be better exemplified than with regard to the theory of the equality of human nature. Charles H. McElwain likewise observes that, the idea of the equality of men is the most profound contribution of the Stoics to political thought, and that, its greatest influence is in the changed conception of law that in part resulted from it. Natural law first appeared among the Stoics who believed that God is everywhere and in everyone see classical pantheism. According to this belief, within humans there is a «divine spark» which helps them to live in accordance with nature. The Stoics felt that there was a way in which the universe had been designed, and that natural law helped us to harmonize with this. <laughs> Ancient Rome Cicero wrote in his De Legibus that both justice and law originate from what nature has given to humanity, from what the human mind embraces, from the function of humanity, and from what serves to unite humanity. For Cicero, natural law obliges us to contribute to the general good of the larger society. The purpose of positive laws is to provide for the safety of citizens, the preservation of states, and the tranquility and happiness of human life. In this view, wicked and unjust statutes are anything but laws because in the very definition of the term law there inheres the idea and principle of choosing what is just and true law for cicero ought to be a reformer of vice and an incentive to virtue cicero expressed the view that the virtues which we ought to cultivate always tend to our own happiness and that the best means of promoting them consists in living with men in that perfect union and charity which are cemented by mutual benefits in De Republica, he writes, There is indeed a law, right reason, which is in accordance with nature, existing in all, unchangeable, eternal. Commanding us to do what is right, forbidding us to do what is wrong. It has dominion over good men, but possesses no influence over bad ones. No other law can be substituted for it, no part of it can be taken away, nor can it be abrogated altogether. Neither the people or the senate can absolve from it. It is not one thing at Rome, and another thing at Athens, one thing today, and another thing tomorrow, but it is eternal and immutable for all nations and for all time. Cicero influenced the discussion of natural law for many centuries to come, up through the era of the American Revolution. The jurisprudence of the Roman Empire was rooted in Cicero, who held an extraordinary grip upon the imagination of posterity. As the medium for the propagation of those ideas which informed the law and institutions of the empire." Cicero's conception of natural law, "...found its way to later centuries notably through the writings of Saint Isidore of Seville and the Decretum of Gratian." Thomas Aquinas, in his summary of medieval natural law, quoted Cicero's statement that, "...nature," and "...custom." Were the sources of a society's laws. The Renaissance Italian historian Leonardo Bruni praised Cicero as the person who carried philosophy from Greece to Italy, and nourished it with the golden river of his eloquence. The legal culture of Elizabethan England, exemplified by Sir Edward Coke, was steeped in Ciceronian rhetoric. The Scottish moral philosopher Francis Hutcheson, as a student at Glasgow, was attracted most by Cicero, for whom he always professed the greatest admiration. More generally in 18th century Great Britain, Cicero's name was a household word among educated people. Likewise, in the admiration of early Americans Cicero took pride of place as orator, political theorist, stylist, and moralist. The British polemicist Thomas Gordon incorporated Cicero into the radical ideological tradition that travelled from the mother country to the colonies in the course of the 18th century and decisively shaped early American political culture. Cicero's description of the immutable, eternal, and universal natural law was quoted by Berlamachy and later by the American revolutionary legal scholar James Wilson. Cicero became John Adams's foremost model of public service, republican virtue, and forensic eloquence. 
Adams wrote of Cicero that, as all the ages of the world have not produced a greater statesman and philosopher united in the same character, his authority should have great weight. Thomas Jefferson first encountered Cicero as a schoolboy while learning Latin, and continued to read his letters and discourses throughout his life. He admired him as a patriot, valued his opinions as a moral philosopher, and there is little doubt that he looked upon Cicero's life, with his love of study and aristocratic country life, as a model for his own. Jefferson described Cicero as the father of eloquence and philosophy. Topic: Christianity. The New Testament carries a further exposition on the Abrahamic dialogue and links to the later Greek exposition on the subject when Paul's epistle to the Romans states, "For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another." The intellectual historian A. J. Carlyle has commented on this passage, "...there can be little doubt that St. Paul's words imply some conception analogous to the natural law in Cicero, a law written in men's hearts, recognized by man's reason, a law distinct from the positive law of any state, or from what St. Paul recognized as the revealed law of God." It is in this sense that St. Paul's words are taken by the fathers of the 4th and 5th centuries like St. Hilary of Poitiers, St. Ambrose, and St. Augustine, and there seems no reason to doubt the correctness of their interpretation." Because of its origins in the Old Testament, early Church Fathers, especially those in the West, saw natural law as part of the natural foundation of Christianity. The most notable among these was Augustine of Hippo, who equated natural law with humanity's prelapsarian state. As such, a life according to unbroken human nature was no longer possible, and persons needed instead to seek healing and salvation through the divine law and grace of Jesus Christ. In the 12th century, Gratian equated the natural law with divine law. Albertus Magnus would address the subject a century later, and his pupil, St. Thomas Aquinas, in his Summa Theologica I 2 QQ. 90 to 106 restored natural law to its independent state asserting natural law as the rational creature's participation in the eternal law yet since human reason could not fully comprehend the eternal law it needed to be supplemented by revealed divine law see also biblical law in christianity meanwhile aquinas taught that all human or positive laws were to be judged by their conformity to the natural law an unjust law is not a law in the full sense of the word it retains merely the appearance of law insofar as it is duly constituted and enforced in the same way a just law is, but is itself a perversion of law. At this point, the natural law was not only used to pass judgment on the moral worth of various laws, but also to determine what those laws meant in the first place. This principle laid the seed for possible societal tension with reference to tyrants. The natural law was inherently teleological, however, it is most assuredly not deontological. For Christians, natural law is how human beings manifest the divine image in their life. This mimicry of God's own life is impossible to accomplish except by means of the power of grace. Thus, whereas deontological systems merely require certain duties be performed, Christianity explicitly states that no one can, in fact, perform any duties if grace is lacking. For Christians, natural law flows not from divine commands, but from the fact that humanity is made in God's image, humanity is empowered by God's grace. Living the natural law is how humanity displays the gifts of life and grace, the gifts of all that is good. Consequences are in God's hands, consequences are generally not within human control, thus in natural law, actions are judged by three things, one, the person's intent, two, the circumstances of the act and three, the nature of the act. The apparent good or evil consequence resulting from the moral act is not relevant to the act itself. The specific content of the natural law is therefore determined by how each person's acts mirror God's internal life of love. Insofar as one lives the natural law, temporal satisfaction may or may not be attained, but salvation will be attained. The state, in being bound by the natural law, is conceived as an institution whose purpose is to assist in bringing its subjects to true happiness. True happiness derives from living in harmony with the mind of God as an image of the living God. In the 16th century, the school of Salamanca Francisco Suárez, Francisco de Vitoria, etc. further developed a philosophy of natural law. After the Protestant Reformation, some Protestant denominations maintained parts of the Catholic concept of natural law. 
The English theologian Richard Hooker from the Church of England adapted Thomistic notions of natural law to Anglicanism five principles, to live, to learn, to reproduce, to worship God, and to live in an ordered society. Islamic natural law Abu Rayhan al-Biruni, an Islamic scholar and polymath scientist, understood natural law as the survival of the fittest. He argued that the antagonism between human beings can only be overcome through a divine law, which he believed to have been sent through prophets. This is also the position of the Ash'ari school, the largest school of Sunni theology. Averroes Ibn Rushdi, in his treatise on justice and jihad and his commentary on Plato's Republic, writes that the human mind can know of the unlawfulness of killing and stealing and thus of the five makassid or higher intents of the Islamic sharia or to protect religion, life, property, offspring, and reason. The concept of natural law entered the mainstream of Western culture through his Aristotelian commentaries, influencing the subsequent Averroist movement and the writings of Thomas Aquinas. The Maturity School, the second largest school of Sunni theology, posits the existence of a form of natural law. Abu Mansur al Maturidi stated that the human mind could know of the existence of God and the major forms of good and evil without the help of revelation. Al Maturidi gives the example of stealing, which is known to be evil by reason alone due to people's working hard for their property. Killing, fornication, and drinking alcohol were all evils the human mind could know of according to Al Maturidi. The concept of istila in Islamic law bears some similarities to the natural law tradition in the West, as exemplified by Thomas Aquinas. However, whereas natural law deems good what is self-evidently good, according as it tends towards the fulfillment of the person, Istila calls good whatever is connected to one of five basic goods. Al-Ghazali abstracted these basic goods from the legal precepts in the Quran and Sunnah, they are religion, life, reason, lineage, and property. Some add also honor. Ibn Qayyim al jatiya also posited that human reason could discern between great sins and good deeds. Brion law Early Irish law, and Sentius Moore the Great Tradition mentions in a number of places rect aeknid or natural law. This is a concept predating European legal theory, and reflects a type of law that is universal and may be determined by reason and observation of natural action. Neil MacLeod identifies concepts that law must accord with, for truth and delige right or entitlement. These two terms occur frequently, though Irish law never strictly defines them. Similarly, the term chorus law in accordance with proper order occurs in some places, and even in the titles of certain texts. These were two very real concepts to the jurists and the value of a given judgment with respect to them was apparently ascertainable. MacLeod has also suggested that most of the specific laws mentioned have passed the test of time and thus their truth has been confirmed, while other provisions are justified in other ways because they are younger and have not been tested over time the laws were written in the oldest dialect of the Irish language, called Berlafaini which even at the time was so difficult that persons about to become brains had to be specially instructed in it. The length of time from beginning to becoming a learned Brion was usually 20 years. Although under the law any third person could fulfill the duty if both parties agreed, and both were sane. It has been included in an ethno-Celtic breakaway subculture, as it has religious undertones and freedom of religious expression allows it to once again be used as a valid system in Western Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Catholic natural law jurisprudence The Catholic Church holds the view of natural law introduced by Albertus Magnus and elaborated by Thomas Aquinas, particularly in his Summa Theologiae, and often as filtered through the school of Salamanca. This view is also shared by some Protestants, and was delineated by Anglican writer C. S. Lewis in his works Mere Christianity and the Abolition of Man. The Catholic Church understands human beings to consist of body and mind, the physical and the non-physical or soul perhaps, and that the two are inextricably linked. Humans are capable of discerning the difference between good and evil because they have a conscience. There are many manifestations of the good that we can pursue. Some, like procreation, are common to other animals, while others, like the pursuit of truth, are inclinations peculiar to the capacities of human beings. To know what is right, one must use one's reason and apply it to Thomas Aquinas' precepts. This reason is believed to be embodied, in its most abstract form, in the concept of a primary precept good is to be sought, evil avoided. St. Thomas explains that 
there belongs to the natural law, first, certain most general precepts, that are known to all, and secondly, certain secondary and more detailed precepts, which are, as it were, conclusions following closely from first principles. As to those general principles, the natural law, in the abstract, can nowise be blotted out from men's hearts. But it is blotted out in the case of a particular action, insofar as reason is hindered from applying the general principle to a particular point of practice, on account of concupiscence or some other passion, as stated above 77, 2. But as to the other, i.e., the secondary precepts, the natural law can be blotted out from the human heart, either by evil persuasions, just as in speculative matters errors occur in respect of necessary conclusions, or by vicious customs and corrupt habits, as among some men, theft, and even unnatural vices, as the Apostle states room, I, were not esteemed sinful. However, while the primary and immediate precepts cannot be blotted out, the secondary precepts can be. Therefore, for a deontological ethical theory they are open to a surprisingly large amount of interpretation and flexibility. Any rule that helps humanity to live up to the primary or subsidiary precepts can be a secondary precept, for example, Drunkenness is wrong because it injures one's health, and worse, destroys one's ability to reason, which is fundamental to humans as rational animals i.e., does not support self-preservation. Theft is wrong because it destroys social relations, and humans are by nature social animals i.e., does not support the subsidiary precept of living in society. Natural moral law is concerned with both exterior and interior acts, also known as action and motive. Simply doing the right thing is not enough, to be truly moral one's motive must be right as well. For example, helping an old lady across the road good exterior act to impress someone bad interior act is wrong. However, good intentions don't always lead to good actions. The motive must coincide with the cardinal or theological virtues. Cardinal virtues are acquired through reason applied to nature, they are prudence justice temperance fortitude theological virtues are faith hope Charity according to Aquinas, to lack any of these virtues is to lack the ability to make a moral choice. For example, consider a person who possesses the virtues of justice, prudence, and fortitude, yet lacks temperance. Due to their lack of self-control and desire for pleasure, despite their good intentions, they will find themselves swaying from the moral path. <laughs> English jurisprudence Heinrich A. Roman remarked upon the tenacity with which the spirit of the English common law retained the conceptions of natural law and equity which it had assimilated during the Catholic Middle Ages, thanks especially to the influence of Henry de Bracton d. 1268 and Sir John Fortescue d. CIR. 1476. Bracton's translator notes that Bracton was a trained jurist with the principles and distinctions of Roman jurisprudence firmly in mind. But Bracton adapted such principles to English purposes rather than copying slavishly. In particular, Bracton turned the imperial Roman maxim that, "...the will of the prince is law," on its head, insisting that the king is under the law. The legal historian Charles F. Mullet has noted Bracton's, "...ethical definition of law, his recognition of justice, and finally his devotion to natural rights." Bracton considered justice to be the, "...fountain head," from which, all rights arise. For his definition of justice, Bracton quoted the 12th century Italian jurist Azo, Justice is the constant and unfailing will to give to each his right. Bracton's work was the second legal treatise studied by the young apprentice lawyer Thomas Jefferson. Fortescue stressed, the supreme importance of the law of God and of nature, in works that, profoundly influenced the course of legal development in the following centuries. The legal scholar Ella Sandoz has noted that, the historically ancient and the ontologically higher law—eternal, divine, natural—are woven together to compose a single harmonious texture in Fortescue's account of English law." As the legal historian Norman Doe explains, "...Fortescue follows the general pattern set by Aquinas. The objective of every legislator is to dispose people to virtue. It is by means of law that this is accomplished." Fortescue's definition of law, also found in Acertius and Bracton, after all, was a sacred sanction commanding what is virtuous, honester, and forbidding the contrary. Fortescue cited the great Italian Leonardo Bruni for his statement that 
"...virtue alone produces happiness." Christopher Street Germain's doctor and student was a classic of English jurisprudence, and it was thoroughly annotated by Thomas Jefferson. Saint Germain informs his readers that English lawyers generally don't use the phrase, "...law of nature," but rather use, "...reason," as the preferred synonym. Norman Doe notes that Saint Germain's view, "...is essentially Thomist," quoting Thomas Aquinas's definition of law as an ordinance of reason made for the common good by him who has charge of the community, and promulgated." Sir Edward Coke was the preeminent jurist of his time. Coke's preeminence extended across the ocean. For the American revolutionary leaders, law meant Sir Edward Coke's custom and right reason. Coke defined law as, "...perfect reason, which commands those things that are proper and necessary and which prohibits contrary things." For Coke, human nature determined the purpose of law, and law was superior to any one person's reason or will. Coke's discussion of natural law appears in his report of Calvin's case 1608. The law of nature is that which God at the time of creation of the nature of man infused into his heart, for his preservation and direction." In this case the judges found that the legence or faith of the subject is due unto the king by the law of nature, secondly, that the law of nature is part of the law of England, thirdly, that the law of nature was before any judicial or municipal law, fourthly, that the law of nature is immutable." To support these findings, the assembled judges as reported by Coke, who was one of them cited as authorities Aristotle, Cicero, and the Apostle Paul, as well as Bracton, Fortescue, and Saint Germain. After Coke, the most famous common law jurist of the 17th century is Sir Matthew Hale. Hale wrote a treatise on natural law that circulated among English lawyers in the 18th century and survives in three manuscript copies. This natural law treatise has been published as of the Law of Nature 2015. Hale's definition of the natural law reads, "...it is the law of Almighty God given by him to man with his nature discovering the moral good and moral evil of moral actions, commanding the former, and forbidding the latter by the secret voice or dictate of his implanted nature, his reason, and his conscience." He viewed natural law as antecedent, preparatory, and subsequent to civil government, and stated that human law, "...cannot forbid what the law of nature enjoins, nor command what the law of nature prohibits." He cited as authorities Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Seneca, Epictetus, and the Apostle Paul. He was critical of Hobbes's reduction of natural law to self-preservation and Hobbes's account of the state of nature, but drew positively on Hugo Grotius's De Jure Belli A.C. Pacis, Francisco Suarez's Tractatus de Legibus A.C. Dio Legislator, and John Selden's De Jure Naturally et Gentium Juxta Disciplinum Ebraeorum. As early as the 13th century, it was held that the law of nature is the ground of all laws", and by the Chancellor and judges that, "...it is required by the law of nature that every person, before he can be punished, ought to be present, and if absent by contumacy, he ought to be summoned and make default." Further, in 1824, we find it held that proceedings in our courts are founded upon the law of England, and that law is again founded upon the law of nature and the revealed law of God. If the right sought to be enforced is inconsistent with either of these, the English municipal courts cannot recognize it. <laughs> Hobbes By the 17th century, the medieval teleological view came under intense criticism from some quarters. Thomas Hobbes instead founded a contractarian theory of legal positivism on what all men could agree upon, what they sought happiness was subject to contention, but a broad consensus could form around what they feared violent death at the hands of another. The natural law was how a rational human being, seeking to survive and prosper, would act. Natural law, therefore, was discovered by considering humankind's natural rights, whereas previously it could be said that natural rights were discovered by considering the natural law. In Hobbes' opinion, the only way natural law could prevail was for men to submit to the commands of the sovereign. Because the ultimate source of law now comes from the sovereign, and the sovereign's decisions need not be grounded in morality, legal positivism is born. Jeremy Bentham's modifications on legal positivism further developed the theory. As used by Thomas Hobbes in his treatises Leviathan and De Civ, natural law is a precept, or general rule, found out by reason, by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive of his life, or takes away the means of preserving the same, and to omit that by which he thinks it may best be preserved." According to Hobbes, there are nineteen laws. The first two are expounded in Chapter 14 of Leviathan. 
are the first and second natural laws, and of contracts, the others in Chapter 15, of other laws of nature. The first law of nature is that every man ought to endeavor peace, as far as he has hope of obtaining it, and when he cannot obtain it, that he may seek and use all helps and advantages of war. The second law of nature is that a man be willing, when others are so too, as far forth, as for peace, and defense of himself he shall think it necessary, to lay down this right to all things, and be contented with so much liberty against other men, as he would allow other men against himself. The third law is that men perform their covenants made. In this law of nature consisteth the fountain and original of justice. When a covenant is made, then to break it is unjust and the definition of injustice is no other than the not performance of covenant. And whatsoever is not unjust is just. The fourth law is that a man which receiveth benefit from another of mere grace, endeavour that he which giveth it, have no reasonable cause to repent him of his good will. Breach of this law is called ingratitude. The fifth law is complaisance, that every man strive to accommodate himself to the rest. The observers of this law may be called sociable, the contrary, stubborn, insociable, forward, intractable. The sixth law is that upon caution of the future time, a man ought to pardon the offences past of them that repenting, desire it. The seventh law is that in revenges, men look not at the greatness of the evil past, but the greatness of the good to follow. The eighth law is that no man by deed, word, countenance, or gesture, declare hatred or contempt of another. The breach of which law is commonly called contumely. The ninth law is that every man acknowledge another for his equal by nature. The breach of this precept is pride. The tenth law is that at the entrance into the conditions of peace, no man require to reserve to himself any right, which he is not content should be reserved to every one of the rest. The breach of this precept is arrogance, and observers of the precept are called modest. The eleventh law is that if a man be trusted to judge between man and man, that he deal equally between them. The twelfth law is that such things as cannot be divided, be enjoyed in common, if it can be, and if the quantity of the thing permit, without stint, otherwise proportionably to the number of them that have right. The thirteenth law is the entire right, or else, the first possession in the case of alternating use, of a thing that can neither be divided nor enjoyed in common should be determined by lottery. The fourteenth law is that those things which cannot be enjoyed in common, nor divided, ought to be adjudged to the first possessor, and in some cases to the firstborn, as acquired by lot. The fifteenth law is that all men that mediate peace be allowed safe conduct. The sixteenth law is that they that are at controversy, submit their right to the judgment of an arbitrator. The seventeenth law is that no man is a fit arbitrator in his own cause. The eighteenth law is that no man should serve as a judge in a case if greater profit, or honor, or pleasure apparently ariseth for him out of the victory of one party, than of the other. The nineteenth law is that in a disagreement of fact, the judge should not give more weight to the testimony of one party than another, and absent other evidence, should give credit to the testimony of other witnesses. Hobbes's philosophy includes a frontal assault on the founding principles of the earlier natural legal tradition, disregarding the traditional association of virtue with happiness, and likewise redefining law to remove any notion of the promotion of the common good. Hobbes has no use for Aristotle's association of nature with human perfection, inverting Aristotle's use of the word, nature. Hobbes posits a primitive, unconnected state of nature in which men, having a natural proclivity to hurt each other, also have a right to everything, even to one another's body, and nothing can be unjust in this war of every man against every man, in which human life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short", rejecting Cicero's view that people join in society primarily through a certain social spirit which nature has implanted in man. Hobbes declares that men join in society simply for the purpose of getting themselves out from that miserable condition of war, which is necessarily consequent to the natural passions of men, when there is no visible power to keep them in awe. As part of his campaign against the classical idea of natural human sociability, Hobbes inverts that fundamental natural legal maxim, the golden rule. Hobbes's version is do not that to another, which thou wouldst not have done to thyself. <laughs> Cumberland's rebuttal of Hobbes the English cleric Richard Cumberland wrote a lengthy and influential attack on Hobbes's depiction of individual self-interest as the essential feature of human motivation. 
Historian Knud Harkinson has noted that in the 18th century, Cumberland was commonly placed alongside Alberico Gentili, Hugo Grotius and Samuel Puffendorf, "...in the triumvirate of 17th-century founders of the modern school of natural law." The 18th-century philosophers Shaftesbury and Hutcheson, "...were obviously inspired in part by Cumberland." Historian John Parkin likewise describes Cumberland's work as one of the most important works of ethical and political theory of the 17th century." Parkin observes that much of Cumberland's material "...is derived from Roman Stoicism, particularly from the work of Cicero, as Cumberland deliberately cast his engagement with Hobbes in the mold of Cicero's debate between the Stoics, who believed that nature could provide an objective morality, and Epicureans, who argued that morality was human, conventional and self-interested. In doing so, Cumberland de-emphasized the overlay of Christian dogma in particular, the doctrine of original sin, and the corresponding presumption that humans are incapable of perfecting themselves without divine intervention that had accreted to natural law in the Middle Ages. By way of contrast to Hobbes's multiplicity of laws, Cumberland states in the very first sentence of his treatise of the laws of nature that all the laws of nature are reduced to that one, of benevolence toward all rationals." He later clarifies, "...by the name rationals I beg leave to understand, as well God as man, and I do it upon the authority of Cicero." Cumberland argues that the mature development perfection of human nature involves the individual human willing and acting for the common good. For Cumberland, human interdependence precludes Hobbes's natural right of each individual to wage war against all the rest for personal survival. However, Harkinson warns against reading Cumberland as a proponent of enlightened self-interest. Rather, the proper moral love of humanity is a disinterested love of God through love of humanity in ourselves as well as others. Cumberland concludes that actions principally conducive to our happiness are those that promote the honor and glory of God, and also, charity and justice towards men. Cumberland emphasizes that desiring the well being of our fellow humans is essential to the pursuit of our own happiness. He cites reason as the authority for his conclusion that happiness consists in the most extensive benevolence, but he also mentions as essential ingredients of happiness the benevolent affections, meaning love and benevolence towards others", as well as that joy, which arises from their happiness. American jurisprudence The U.S. Declaration of Independence states that it has become necessary for the people of the United States to assume, "...the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them." Some early American lawyers and judges perceived natural law as too tenuous, amorphous, and evanescent a legal basis for grounding concrete rights and governmental limitations. Natural law did, however, serve as authority for legal claims and rights in some judicial decisions, legislative acts, and legal pronouncements. Robert Lowry Clinton argues that the U.S. Constitution rests on a common law foundation and the common law, in turn, rests on a classical natural law foundation. European liberal natural law Liberal natural law grew out of the medieval Christian natural law theories and out of Hobbes' revision of natural law, sometimes in an uneasy balance of the two. Sir Alberico Gentili and Hugo Grotius based their philosophies of international law on natural law. In particular, his writings on freedom of the seas and just war theory directly appealed to natural law. About natural law itself, he wrote that even the will of an omnipotent being cannot change or abrogate natural law, which would maintain its objective validity even if we should assume the impossible, that there is no God or that he does not care for human affairs. De iure belli a c pacis, prolegomeni 11. This is the famous argument etiam zidarimus non sedm, that made natural law no longer dependent on theology. However, German church historians Ernst Wolff and M. Ells disagreed and claimed that Grotius's concept of natural law did have a theological basis. In Grotius's view, the Old Testament contained moral precepts e.g. the Decalogue which Christ confirmed and therefore were still valid. Moreover, they were useful in explaining the content of natural law. 
Both biblical revelation and natural law originated in God and could therefore not contradict each other. In a similar way, Samuel Puffendorf gave natural law a theological foundation and applied it to his concepts of government and international law. John Locke incorporated natural law into many of his theories and philosophy, especially in two treatises of government. There is considerable debate about whether his conception of natural law was more akin to that of Aquinas filtered through Richard Hooker or Hobbes' radical reinterpretation, though the effect of Locke's understanding is usually phrased in terms of a revision of Hobbes upon Hobbesian contractarian grounds. Locke turned Hobbes' prescription around, saying that if the ruler went against natural law and failed to protect "...life, liberty, and property." People could justifiably overthrow the existing state and create a new one. While Locke spoke in the language of natural law, the content of this law was by and large protective of natural rights, and it was this language that later liberal thinkers preferred. Political philosopher Jeremy Waldron has pointed out that Locke's political thought was based on a particular set of Protestant Christian assumptions. To Locke, the content of natural law was identical with biblical ethics as laid down especially in the Decalogue, Christ's teaching and exemplary life, and St. Paul's admonitions. Locke derived the concept of basic human equality, including the equality of the sexes, Adam and Eve, from Genesis chapter 1, 26–28, the starting point of the theological doctrine of Imago Dei. One of the consequences is that as all humans are created equally free, governments need the consent of the governed. Thomas Jefferson, arguably echoing Locke, appealed to unalienable rights in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness." The Lockean idea that governments need the consent of the governed was also fundamental to the Declaration of Independence, as the American revolutionaries used it as justification for their separation from the British Crown. The Belgian philosopher of law Frank Van Dunn is one among those who are elaborating a secular conception of natural law in the liberal tradition. Libertarian theorist Murray Rothbard argues that, the very existence of a natural law discoverable by reason is a potentially powerful threat to the status quo and a standing reproach to the reign of blindly traditional custom or the arbitrary will of the state apparatus." Ludwig von Mises states that he relayed the general sociological and economic foundations of the liberal doctrine upon utilitarianism, rather than natural law, but R. A. Gontz argues that, "...the reality of the argument constituting his system overwhelms his denial." Murray Rothbard, however, says that Gontz makes a lot of errors and distortions in the analysis of Mises's works, including making confusions about the term which Mises uses to refer to scientific laws, laws of nature, saying it characterizes Mises as a natural law philosopher. David Gordon notes, "When most people speak of natural law, what they have in mind is the contention that morality can be derived from human nature." If human beings are rational animals of such and such a sort, then the moral virtues are filling in the blanks is the difficult part." Economist and philosopher F. A. Hayek said that, originally, "...the term natural was used to describe an orderliness or regularity that was not the product of deliberate human will. Together with organism, it was one of the two terms generally understood to refer to the spontaneously grown in contrast to the invented or designed." Its use in this sense had been inherited from the Stoic philosophy, had been revived in the 12th century, and it was finally under its flag that the late Spanish schoolmen developed the foundations of the genesis and functioning of spontaneously formed social institutions." The idea that natural was the product of designing reason is a product of a 17th-century rationalist reinterpretation of the law of nature. Louis Molina, for example, when referred to the natural price, explained that it is so called because it results from the thing itself without regard to laws and decrees, but is dependent on many circumstances which alter it, such as the sentiments of men, their estimation of different uses, often even in consequence of whims and pleasures. And even John Locke, when talking about the foundations of natural law and explaining what he thought when citing reason, said, by reason, however, I do not think is meant here that faculty of the understanding which forms trait of thought and deduces proofs, but certain definite principles of action from which spring all virtues and whatever is necessary for the proper molding of morals." This anti-rationalist approach to human affairs, for Hayek, was the same which guided Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, such as Adam Smith, David Hume and Adam Ferguson, to make their case for liberty. For them, no one can have the knowledge necessary to plan society, and this natural or 
spontaneous order of society shows how it can efficiently plan bottom up. Also, the idea that law is just a product of deliberate design, denied by natural law and linked to legal positivism, can easily generate totalitarianism. If law is wholly the product of deliberate design, whatever the designer decrees to be law is just by definition an unjust law becomes a contradiction in terms. The will of the duly authorized legislator is then wholly unfettered and guided solely by his concrete interests. This idea is wrong because law cannot be just a product of reason. No system of articulated law can be applied except within a framework of generally recognized but often unarticulated rules of justice." However, a secular critique of the natural law doctrine was stated by Pierre Charon in his De la Sagesse the sign of a natural law must be the universal respect in which it is held, for if there was anything that nature had truly commanded us to do, we would undoubtedly obey it universally, not only would every nation respect it, but every individual. Instead there is nothing in the world that is not subject to contradiction and dispute, nothing that is not rejected, not just by one nation, but by many, equally, there is nothing that is strange and in the opinion of many, unnatural that is not approved in many countries, and authorized by their customs. <laughs> Contemporary jurisprudence In jurisprudence, natural law can refer to the several doctrines, that just laws are immanent in nature, that is, they can be «discovered» or «found» but not «created» by such things as a bill of rights, that they can emerge by the natural process of resolving conflicts, as embodied by the evolutionary process of the common law, or that the meaning of law is such that its content cannot be determined except by reference to moral principles. These meanings can either oppose or complement each other, although they share the common trait that they rely on inherence as opposed to design in finding just laws, whereas legal positivism would say that a law can be unjust without it being any less a law, and natural law jurisprudence would say that there is something legally deficient about an unjust norm. Legal interpretivism, famously defended in the English-speaking world by Ronald Dworkin, claims to have a position different from both natural law and positivism. Besides utilitarianism and Kantianism, natural law jurisprudence has in common with virtue ethics that it is a live option for a first principles ethics theory in analytic philosophy. The concept of natural law was very important in the development of the English common law. In the struggles between Parliament and the monarch, Parliament often made reference to the fundamental laws of England, which were at times said to embody natural law principles since time immemorial and set limits on the power of the monarchy. According to William Blackstone, however, natural law might be useful in determining the content of the common law and in deciding cases of equity, but was not itself identical with the laws of England. Nonetheless, the implication of natural law in the common law tradition has meant that the great opponents of natural law and advocates of legal positivism, like Jeremy Bentham, have also been staunch critics of the common law. Natural law jurisprudence is currently undergoing a period of reformulation as is legal positivism. The most prominent contemporary natural law jurist, Australian John Finnis, is based in Oxford, but there are also Americans Germaine Grisses, Robert P. George, and Canadian Joseph Boyle and Brazilian Emidio Brasileiro. All have tried to construct a new version of natural law. The 19th-century anarchist and legal theorist, Lysander Spooner, was also a figure in the expression of modern natural law. New natural law, as it is sometimes called, originated with Grisses. It focuses on basic human goods", such as human life, knowledge, and aesthetic experience, which are self-evidently and intrinsically worthwhile, and states that these goods reveal themselves as being incommensurable with one another. The tensions between the natural law and the positive law have played, and continue to play a key role in the development of international law. See also equals equals notes